old. <laughs> Brother, Brother Powers is, I don't know if he's from Michigan, but he pastored a church in Michigan as well. <laughs> so you guys have a double dose <laughs> of some Michigan people down here. But it, it's good to have the Powers with us. Um, we have... They, they're always welcome. Uh, and I'm glad when he walked in, he said, you know, I feel like home here. And that's the way it should be with everybody and anybody that walks in those doors. With all of our missionaries, we have a very good relationship with every one of them. And the one thing that impresses me, there are many, but each time I talk to them, they're praying for us just as much as we're praying for them. And it blesses my heart. Uh, we're going to take a love offering after the service for them. I don't want to give away too much, but Brother Powers wants to come and tell us what's going on in his life and what God's doing to him. He's going to bring forth the message. Brother Powers, it's always a blessing to have you. Come up here and don't forget to introduce your beautiful wife as well. guess I'm on okay. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me now? Okay, good. You can hear me, you can hear me anyway. <laughs> Probably wouldn't need this microphone. All right. You know, as we were singing that song, Living by Faith, you know who I, who I was thinking of? I could hear this old preacher singing that song. It come on the radio every day, and I'm sure you've heard of Lester Roloff. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lester Roloff. That would be one of the songs that he would introduce his program with, Living by Faith. And I, I re told my wife, I said, you know, I, I, I hear Lester Roloff. <laughs> I hear him singing that song, what a blessing it was. I, I enjoy that song. In fact, I enjoy the old hymns. Okay, my wife, Gail, most of you know her. Uh, she's been by my side now for uh, 50, almost 53 years. This coming April, 53 years. And I tell you what, that's a long time. <laughs> now, I don't say that with, with any trepidation or anything. I just, 53 years has been a long time. And so uh, we, uh, of course, if it had not been for the Lord being in our life, it may have ended a lot quicker than that. But I'm, it's not ended. <laughs> well, I'm just digging deeper and deeper, ain't I? <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, 53 years and... Um, Four kids, uh, 11 great-grandkids, and two great-great-grandkids. Yes, I'm that old. 11 grandkids and two... Okay, did I, did I mess it up? I, okay, well, that figures. <laughs> yeah, I could start. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a blessing all these years, so... You know, I, I could uh, tell you some stories and go back in time here a little bit, but we'll move on quickly. I want to thank you again, Pastor, for allowing me to come. Church, thank you for being so open and welcoming to us. As Pastor already stated, we, you know, we feel like we're home here. I might as well, we might as well join this church. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> might as well. <clears throat> but uh, let me give you a little bit of an update on what's going on. Um, of course, COVID, that's what's going on. Uh, forced us to get out of Cambodia. Matter of fact, we took the last, I may have shared this with you last time I was here, but we took the last uh, plane out of Phnom Penh before they shut down all the airports. Uh, they were getting ready to shut down Phnom Penh's airport. Uh, the hubs that we fly out of uh, from uh, Southeast Asia would be um, uh, Narita, Japan. That was closing, and Seoul, South Korea, and especially Seoul. Uh, we were watching it on TV and how things were going there and the COVID. You know, that was one of the first major airports that it really hit. And they shut that thing down. We just got the last flight out. We were, in, uh, we were having to order our food in because we were afraid to go out in the community there because it's in Cambodia, third world country. Everybody has to work every day. And so the Chinese were coming in from Wuhan. Uh, we, you know that Cambodia and uh, China are uh, compadres. They, they're allies with one another. 
And so there was no restrictions for the Chinese coming in like that. Now, I'm not against them opposed to Chinese people. It's just that they did not restrict that. And maybe busloads were coming in, Phnom Penh. And so that made it a little more uh, harder on us to really get out in the community. So we decided that we, it's best for us to go ahead and leave now. Now, most of the time when we came home before, it was only because of her medical. And we mostly stayed local here. But this time, we were going to take a furlough to go report to some churches because they were breathing down my neck <laughs> to come to report to them. I hadn't done it for a while. So we decided to do that during this, uh, during this time, but little did we know that when we got home, uh, most of all the churches were shutting down. They weren't letting anyone in. And so we thought, well, now what are we going to do? Uh, we can't go out and visit churches. There was a few here and there we probably could have went to, but we didn't want to travel from here to uh, New York just for one church. That gets expensive. It gets very expensive. So we decided that we would just uh, lay low and just visit some local churches and do some things, whatever we can do. And, uh, of course, as time goes on, you know about the rest of the story. Right now in Cambodia, um, it you have to pay $2,000 a piece. It was $3,000 a piece just to be able to get in and start the process of entering the country, uh, getting checked for COVID and all that stuff. Uh, they quarantined you for two weeks, and they put you in a hotel of their choice. And believe me, you're in a third world country, so you can imagine. So, uh, plus you had to have all kinds of documentation. Uh, you have to have COVID insurance. I don't, I don't know what that is. That's what they're saying. Uh, apparently, you can get it there. I don't, I don't know. And you have to have, again, you have to have all kinds of documentation from here. And so the challenges were great, but that's not the thing that kept us really from really pursuing that. It was the visas. They shut off all tourist visas. You can't get a tourist visa right now. Uh, of course, tourist visa didn't really do us much good because a tourist visa you have to go out of that country and come back in to get another visa. And so that, we, we never used that. We always used a business visa. And so if your business visa had expired, uh, there was a, uh, I forget what they called that, but they were not letting anyone else in there if they didn't ha did not have a business visa that they could extend that was not expired, ours expired. And so we've got that challenge. So that's the major challenge for us right now. Now, just coming over here, we were reading, uh, was it Khmer News? Khmer News. And uh, they have a, a third wave coming into Cambodia right now. And it's got that variant that you've been hearing about, that new variant of the, of the uh, COVID that's getting in there. And so they're starting to lock it all down again. So I don't, I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We've got until July. Hopefully something will work out then. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, I may end up, we may end up having to go in and out of the Philippines. And I can only be there 52 days at a time. But right now, I, they told us last week that the Philippines is locked down until April. So, so things are, things are uh, really, really uh, challenged get back to your field. So pray for us. Pray for us as we look to uh, do something. I, you know, I don't know. If, hopefully they'll open it up by then. Surely they'll open it up by then. So pray for us that we see that that will happen because it's uh, right now we just, we're just kind of in the dark. We just don't know what to do, what's going to happen. So we are taking advantage of the time of the churches that will allow us in uh, to go ahead and come and uh, report to them and let them know what's going on with us and what's going on in Cambodia. All right, this morning, um, famous last words, I won't be keeping you long. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off script a little bit this morning. Um, normally, I like to preach expositionally. I, I, I enjoy that taking uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, taking a section of scriptures and going through those. I think that is probably one of the best ways to preach, although those other uh, ways are valid. You know, you can preach textually or topically. That's all right. 
but I believe that going expositionally is the best. Now, I'm going to get off subject as well. I'm not going to preach on missions. Uh, if the truth were known, you folks probably know all that there is to know about missions. I probably could not challenge you with any new information. Uh, so I decided this morning, perhaps your pastor has already uh, spoken to these particular issues, but uh, if not, I'm going to speak to the issue uh, of what's happening today and what we're faced with and how that we can deal with it, uh, because it is a little unnerving. It's a little unnerving to us to know that we don't know how long this COVID thing is going to be going on and how long it's going to keep us from going back into Cambodia or into Southeast Asia somewhere. A lot of things has happened this year, things I never would have imagined that would have happened. Really, uh, this uh, cancel culture, this, uh, uh, the way that the liberals have used COVID <laughs> to, to bring restrictions to our freedom of speech. Right. Listen, folks, we're, we're experiencing things that normally banana republics experience, but not here in the United States. And so I, I believe that we're, we're starting to, I mean, again, they use the term cancel culture. That's, that's just a colloquialism for really trying to, uh, trying to corral us and our rights. I believe that that's happening. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theory, but I believe there's more behind this than meets the eye. And so, you know, I don't run off and get on tangents about conspiracies, but I do believe that there's things moving rapidly here. Revelation chapter 1 says when these things begin to happen, they'll happen quickly. In fact, the word term there is used uh, is the term we get our word tachometer from. In other words, when they begin to happen, they may start off a little bit slow, but it'll get rapid quickly. And I believe that that's what we're seeing. I believe we're seeing that in our lifetime. And uh, I'm not a prognosticator, but I do believe this is the last days. I've been saying that for a long time, but I believe it. I believe these are the last of the last days that we're experiencing right now. And I think things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse. Anyway, I said all that to say, turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. You know, there is, uh, for the Christian anyway, there's a tension between living for today and looking for tomorrow. That's one of the Christian realities that we experience. We're in this world. We live in this world. We function in this world. But we're looking for another world. And at times, there's a tension between those two worlds. Now, I don't know about you, but the older I get, believe me, the more I'm looking for the other world. Amen. I, I'm looking for that world to come. So the tension that I experienced when I was younger is less. <laughs> that tension's letting loose. I'm believe me, I'm I'm looking for the world to come. I'm looking for that city, as Hebrews chapter eleven says. I'm looking for that better country. But there is a tension. And we often find ourselves caught between the here and now and the hereafter. <laughs> And sometimes it really it's hard to try to function in both of those worlds. It really is. Uh, you know, I've heard people say, and I know you heard this, I've heard preachers say many, many occasions, an old saying, that some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. But you know, you could really reverse that. There's some people so earthly good, I mean, so earth. However that goes, they're no heavenly good. Amen? I'll give you an illustration of that. I was uh, helping a church in West Virginia just for a little while. They lost their pastor. He had died, and uh, they had had an interim in there. They didn't realize that he was propagating a false doctrine. They found out about it, and they were frantic. They were frantic over this. They didn't know what to do, so finally they were able to move him out, and I just so happened was around, and it, it actually was a church I had pastored before. And they said, uh, Brother Powers, and they supported me, and still support me. They said, Brother Powers, can you help us out? Can you help us out with all that? I said, sure, sure, I'll help you. 
And it was during the time of the elections was taking place. I was just up there for a short time. And so everybody was tense about this election. I was, you know, it, by the way, it didn't go my way. And I hope it didn't go your way. Amen. Amen. It certainly didn't go my way. But I knew that God is in charge of all this. That I'm going to trust him no matter what takes place. I don't care who's in that office. God's still in charge. I had a young couple in the church and they came back to church and getting back in, they were, I mean to tell you, they were political up to here. And, uh, and I don't mean to get political this morning, but they were political. And matter of fact, all their eggs were in, in uh, Donald Trump's basket. I mean, they were, well, actually mine was too. But, but I mean to tell you, these people were, you know, so I got up that morning and I began to teach on um, a particular lesson out of Romans 13 that our, what our relationship with the government should be. And, and Paul said, you know, you submit yourselves to the higher powers, the powers that be. And who was the powers that be in, during Paul's time when he wrote that? It was Nero. <laughs> and he was one of the worst, worst leaders of the Roman Empire there. And so, but Paul says, we be, we're to be subject to them, of course, unless it, it violates the Word of God. Now, if it violates the Word of God, that's different. Anyway, I was preaching on that and saying, look, God's in control of this, no matter who's there. And we're to be su submitted to the government, to the president that we have. We are to submit to our authorities. And, and I explained all of that. They got mad. I mean to tell you, they got so mad that they stomped out of that church and railed on me and railed on me because I wasn't a patriot. And so we get these two worlds out of balance. The tension that's there is, is there. And sometimes if, we, if we're not careful... We get these two worlds out of balance and we do become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Or we become so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. I got that one right that time. And so there, there's a tension there. We need to be careful. <clears throat> On one hand, we ought to be living our lives like Jesus Christ could come at any moment. And I believe he can. We believe, in the, uh, we believe that uh, his... Coming is imminent. Paul believed it was imminent. So we need to be living our lives like he could come at any moment. On the other hand, we have God-given responsibilities, I believe, to fulfill in this world. In the meantime, Luke 19 says, Occupy until I come. Now that's a message within itself. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you'd like. Our Bible says that in the last days... Perilous times shall come. That word perilous there is, it has the idea of being hard to deal with. It has, the word, it has the idea of being times of difficulty. One commentator says it has to do with the times that we live in are going to be savage. And again, I say to you, I believe that we're living in those perilous times. That word savage there is the word that our Lord used in Matthew uh, chapter number 8, verse 28, describing the maniac of Gadara as being savage. It suggests that those days, uh, the last days, are going to be energized by demonic forces. And again, we've always experienced in our times the activity of demonic forces. But this term suggests that it's going to be of, of such a magnitude. It's going to be so fierce that it'll be hard for us, as Christians especially, to be able to make it through this life. And I believe those times uh, are upon us now. And he uses the word there, perilous times, times, epochs. It has the idea of something that is slowly festering 
and then suddenly bursts forth. I believe that's the time that we're living in now. I believe what you're seeing now is a bursting forth. Something that had been simmering all these years is bursting forth. I remember pastoring in Bible Baptist, Bernadina, and we would talk about these things during the early 90s. We really hadn't seen it really get so bad yet, but we were talking about it then. And now I see the outcome of all of that. Now I see a bursting forth of what was taking place back then. And that's what's happening, I believe, in our world today. In fact, if you read the book of Revelation, chapter number 12, we are premillennial, we are pre-tribulational in our view. At least I am. <laughs> I, I believe the next thing on the calendar is the rapture amen. for us, amen, or the rupture, whatever you want to call it. I believe that's going to take place, and I believe it's going to take place in our lifetime. But if you go through the book of Revelation, you notice after chapter number four, I believe, that you don't hear, you don't see the term church mentioned. Not until chapter, I believe, chapter 18 or chapter 19, and then you see it mentioned. And in between those verses, most commentators, theologians believe, at least those who take that are dispensational, and they take the eschatological position that I do, they believe that encompass the, the uh, tribulation period of time. In chapter 12, it talks about this war in heaven with Satan. Now, some liken that to the original fall of Satan, but if you'd read it in context, you'll see that it has to do with what's happening in the middle of the tribulation. And it says there was war in heaven and Satan and his demons and those who were with him were, were cast out. And he says Satan was, was, was savage in this earth because he knew that his time was close. I believe that's what we're starting to experience now. Satan knows that his time is very, is drawing very, his demise is drawing near and what you're seeing now on this earth is a bursting forth of that savagery to go after the nation of Israel and to destroy the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe with all of my heart and soul, that's why we're experiencing all this cancel culture. Listen, they're coming after us next. We're the target, the nation of Israel, and we are the target of all of this. They want to cancel us. That's why many people today fear the future. Now, we'll get to the text in just a moment. People are fearful because they have not come this way before. We go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> and we look at verse number 7. So this morning, I'm going to preach on why we don't have to fear. I mean, it looks bad, doesn't it? COVID and all that's taking place and cancel culture and all these things are happening and our borders are being opened up and, and all these policies of the liberal demon crats are just, <laughs> my wife says, <laughs> all right, it's disrupting our, disrupting our country and and, and bring this to places we've never been before. And so a lot of people are in fear of what's taking place. But verse 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, no, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. I believe there's going to come a time, and it's going to come soon, where cancel culture will put an X on us. And if we dare say anything about the gospel in Jesus Christ, we're going to be persecuted for it. But what does Paul say? God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. The word there uh, is the word uh, cowardness he doesn't listen he doesn't give us a spirit of being a coward in all of this but he gives us 
not a spirit of carriedness, or cowardness, or fear, but it gives us a mind, but of power and of love and a sound mind. I recall uh, something I read the other day. It was very interesting. I don't know if you ever heard of nor read about the Boxer Rebellion back in the 1890s, 1900 turn of the century there. That's when the Chinese were going to expel all foreigners from the borders, especially Christians. And it was told during that period of time that the Chinese military encompassed this Christian compound. And they put a cross right at the, at, the, at the entrance. And they said, if you want to live, if you want to live, then you come out here, walk around this cross, and come on the other side. The first seven walked around the cross and came out on the other side. There was one Young lady, she was about 17 years old, Chinese. She came up to the cross. And there she knelt down. There and worshipped her Lord in front of that cross and would not go around it to save her life. After that, 92 Chinese Christians came out of that one after the other and knelt down before the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of Psalm 40, verse 9 and 10, where David says, or the psalmist says, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord. Thou knowest I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Beloved, when cancel culture comes to you and tells you to shut up, God had not give you a spirit of fear. You don't hide his righteousness in your heart. You speak up. You let them know where you stand for Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 18 says, fear has torment. Fear carries with it a kind of torment that's really its own punishment. If you think about it just for a moment. Child of God, you and I can face the future with confidence. And it's because that we have some anchor points that we hold on to, that we never let go. Now, believe me, there may come a time, and it may come soon, where these anchor points is all that you're going to have. Now, listen carefully. An anchor point is assured truths that we have our hope placed on are sure truths that we have our hope placed on. It makes no difference what happens. Christian, we have these anchor points. And we hold to those anchor points. We never let those truths escape us. Because these are the points that keep us from fear. That keep us from being a, a coward. I'm going to give you those real quickly. We're just now getting to the outline but I promise I'll move quickly. Our first anchor point is this. God still reigns. Is this world out of control? No, this world's not out of control. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says. Then we're going to dive into that verse a little bit. It says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him. Now listen carefully. Who worketh all things after the counsel of his will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now we're going to get into a little bit of a theological quagmire here. But the verse says he works how many things? All things. Wait a minute. Does that exclude anything? No, it does not exclude anything. I'll explain in just a moment. Now, some of you may be, I may have tripped some triggers there in your little theological mind about what that means. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. Listen, no matter how turbulent the times, no matter how disturbing the trend, 
no matter how decadent the culture is, no matter how hostile it is, no matter how insecure things may seem, God is still in control. Now, do you believe that? Is God in control or isn't he? He is in control. That couple in, in West Virginia didn't, didn't get that. God is in control. Why do we say that? Because God's attributes says so. God is omnipresent. God doesn't, you know, I hear people say, well, God looks down through the future. That's incorrect. God doesn't have to look down through the annals of time. He didn't have to do that because he's everywhere. Listen, he's everywhere present. God is eternally present. There's no such thing as time to him. Amen. But he's not only omnipresent, he's omniscient. He knows everything. And he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Do you believe that? Amen. Then why do you fear? Amen. Let's take a closer look at Ephesians 1.11. It says again, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Now, I'm, the only reason I'm bringing this in because I believe there's a need for explanation. Does Paul mean all without exception or all without distinction? You think, no, I don't know. I don't know. Let me say to you, I believe that Paul is talking about all things without distinction. That's different than saying all things without, concept, uh, uh, without exception. Let me explain. I'll explain to you. If it's all things without exception, that means God is the author of evil. Does he say all things? But does it mean all things without conception, exception? That means God predetermined a little baby to get raped. If it's all things without exception. That's called hard determinism. I am not. This may kill my support. This may kill my love offering. But I am not a hard determinist. Like the Calvinists are. I'll go ahead and say it. I'm a, can, I, can I bring up some names? You ever heard of John Piper? I know Pastor has. He's a hard determinist. You ever hear of R.C. Sproul? Hard determinist. They, in essence, will tell you, and I can show you their quotes, that God is the author, bring about all the evil. I'm saying our God is sovereign enough to be able to work around and through evil to bring about his perfect will in our lives. There's a difference. The truth is that God is able in his sovereign power to override evil to work for good. The Bible tells us in James 1, 13 and 14 that God is not the author of evil. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. All things work together for good, and they do, because God works in and through all the evil in the world to bring about his perfect will, and he's doing it now. He's doing it now. How many of you like German chocolate cake? If you don't, you should. I love German chocolate. German chocolate cake or coconut cream pie, nothing better. German chocolate cake, what's some of the ingredients that go in German chocolate cake? Chocolate. That's good. Yeah. yeah, but what are some of the other things that go in it? 
Sugar. How many of you like to go get a box of sugar and just drink it right down? Him? Sugar? Oh, my land. What about, what about a bowl of flour? Just take that flour just like it is and just spoon it in your mouth. But boy, I'll tell you what, when you put those ingredients together and you put them in an oven and you cook it, and you, whatever you do to it, bake it, whatever, it comes out to something that absolutely tastes delicious. God brings about all of this stuff in life. He brings it all about and puts it together and it will be for our good. <laughs> Second anchor point, and I've got to move quickly. Brother, how long do I have? Till 12 o'clock? Till I'm done. I like that. Okay, now, so God still reigns. He's still in control. The second anchor point is the church is still precious. I thought I'd get at least a hallelujah there. The church is still precious. Why is that? Because the church is this world's only hope. And Satan knows that. The gospel message that, we, uh, that we're entrusted with is the only hope this world has. John 20, 21. Peace I leave with you. He tells us as the Father has sent me. Now think about this just for a moment. Christ said as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. In other words, as the Father and the reasons the Father sent Jesus Christ into the world... He's doing the same to the church into the world. I'd say that's a precious thing, wouldn't you? 2 Corinthians 5. I'll just read through these verses, starting with verse number, I think it's verse number 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There you have it. The church, now in the place of Jesus Christ, I'm not replacing him, but empowered by the Spirit of God, does the same work in this world as Jesus did. That's why the church is still precious. It's the bride of Christ. Amen? God loves the church, died for the church. It's his bride, as the Word of God says. It's his habitation, the building that he lives in. Third anchor, and I'm moving a little quicker now. Third anchor is our mission is still clear. Our mission is twofold. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Now, I didn't say I was necessarily going to be preaching on missions, but that's missions. Christ says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And because of that, he says, go ye therefore. Amen. Go ye therefore. Take the message to the nations. 1 Peter 2.8 says, We're to exhibit God's character. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I know your pastor knows this. He's already said it. That our mission is clear. The reason this church exists is for missions. You cannot be a New Testament church and not have as your central focus taking the gospel to your area here, to your state, to your nation, and to the world. So our mission is still clear. That's an anchor point that we have. Let's keep on preaching the gospel. Let's keep on supporting missionaries. Let's keep on <clears throat> taking the gospel message to this area here. And not stop. It's an anchor point that we have. We will not stop it. 
fourth anchor point, our focus is still heaven. Amen? Our focus is still heaven. I want you to look with me in the book of Colossians. Let's turn to the book of Colossians. And notice what Paul says here. And again, here we have this tension. You see, you see, occupy till I come. But then on the other hand, you see verses telling us to long for heaven. And again, we've got to keep those in balance. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, look at it. If you then be risen with Christ, or since you've been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The word there for seek is we get our word zestos from that. It means to be passionate. It means to boil with a passion, knowing that one day you're going to be with Christ in heaven. And your purpose and your focus here on earth is to live for the, that moment. Seek those things which are above. Verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Set your mind, your focus. Again, this is part of the tension. So we, we, we put all of our passion, everything in this life, into the next world. Now, it seems contradictory, doesn't it? But it isn't. This is where we got to keep those two spheres, those two tensions in balance. We've got to live in this world. Lord keeps me alive until the next election, I'm going to vote. Amen? I'm going to vote. And I'm going to vote biblical principles. I'm going to vote anti-abortion. Amen? Those are biblical principles, concepts. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Now, I may have related this verse to you one time before, but look, let's do it again. In chapter 4, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, in I think verse number 8, he talks about verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And that's not it. Second Corinthians, I'm in Ephesians, no wonder. <laughs> I'm 71. <laughs> Verse 14. Let me, let me double check here. <laughs> Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Christ Jesus. Actually, I want to, verse number 8. I'll be back if I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. The context of verse 16, 17, and 18 is actually found in verse 7. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the ecstasy of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Let me stop there just a moment and say to you that that's the context of these last three verses. So anything that you're going through, anything that you're challenged with in this life, anything that is bringing you dread, anything that's bringing you fear, anything that's just troubling you in body, or anything that's troubling you in spirit, Paul waylays those fears in verse 16, 17, and 18. Now, I compare this with giving and missions and things that we do and we should do, things that somehow seem to be impediments to you and I being able to give wholeheartedly as we should give. He says, for which cause, Paul says, we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. 
He's simply saying, yes, all these physical challenges that we have are totally overshadowed by the fact this body is deteriorating. It's going back to dust. But something better than that, our spirit is being renewed day by day. We're becoming more like Christ no matter what happens in our life. Paul said in these verses we ought to value the spiritual over the physical. You see, when you get in the midst of persecution, that will become more relevant to you. That will become more relevant to you. Look in verse 17 of that same chapter. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I'm told that this is a hyperbole here. It's a double emphasis to say what we're going to experience when we get the glory based upon what we experience here can't even be compared to there. Again, think about what I'm saying here. Paul is saying, listen, we're going to experience things that you've never experienced before. They can't even compare to this life at all. So we're going to value. We're going to value the eternal over this time continuum we live in. We're going to value the eternal. Amen. The third one is in verse 18. Look at it. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, our anchor point in our focus is still heaven because this is temporal. No matter what you're going through, it's temporal. It's the eternal that we focus on. It's the eternal. So I'm saying to you, no matter what happens during all of this, no matter what takes place, we have some anchor points. We don't have to fear. Fifth and last, listen carefully. Our victory is still certain. Anchor point five, our victory is still certain. Look in Philippians chapter one, verse six, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a promise of God. God says, look, I have predestined. Go back to the book of Ephesians again, chapter 1. And look, let's go ahead and look in verse number 13 and 14 of Ephesians chapter 1. Notice what he says. In whom ye also trusted... After that you heard the word of the truth of the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and the praise of his glory. God has promised us an inheritance. He promised us this. And again, no matter what your life is here, you have an inheritance, beloved, that's coming. Jesus Christ promised it, and it's going to happen. But not only did he promise that inheritance, he predestinated it. So look in chapter 1 again. Look in verses 1 through 5, and I'm going to finish with this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, According as he hath chosen us, uh oh, he hath chosen us in him. Okay, now, preacher, what are you going to do with that one? It didn't, didn't say anything about he, that he arbitrarily chose us for salvation. He said he has, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What has he chosen us for? That's the question to ask that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what he's chosen us for. He didn't say he chose us for salvation here. He says he's chosen us to do this or to be this. That's the chosen. 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God has chosen us, predestinated us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and he's going to bring that about. That's where the predestination comes in. Right there. He's chosen us to be conformed to his will. Now, beloved, that's an anchor point. I hold on to that. I embrace that. Amen? For God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear because we, more than anyone else, have these anchor points that we hold to. It will not be dissuaded, will not be moved, no matter what is happening in our government, no matter what's happening in our culture. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> we have anchor points because we're looking for the next world to come for us. Someone said, to the degree you fear, that is the degree that you have not yet matured in your faith and trust in God and his word. I'm not running around here wringing my hands. So Joe Biden's the president. So Kamala Harris is the vice president. Really the president, but... But I'm not going to worry myself to death about it. I'm not going to be dismayed by it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> go to another country somewhere to live. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to serve my Lord and not be afraid of what happens to him. Because we see him who is invisible. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful and thankful for what you've done for us. Uh, Lord, help us. Uh, Lord, to hold to those anchor points. Those are anchor points. Those are truths, Father, that we're assured of. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to, uh, Lord, fear like those, uh, Lord, who have no hope fear. We thank you for those truths, and I thank you for this church. Pray you bless it, continue to bless it, that it continue to be the lighthouse in this community. Pray for Pastor and his dear wife. Father, that you would keep them healthy, keep them safe, as well as cause this church to burn even hotter in their passion for things, Lord, that are eternal and not temporal. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor?
Brother Brandon, if you'll come forward. We're going to take a love offering for Brother Powers.